Lifeboat 12 by Susan Hood, a first chapter Friday read aloud with the word nerd and the author. Today, as you listen, watch for the story quote that will appear on screen. Write it down word by word and then follow the instructions given to you by your teacher. Stay all the way to the end to see if you've written it down correctly. Hey, it's April, which means it's National Poetry Month. If you're looking for more novels and verse, I've got all of these for you on my channel, or at least I will by the end of April 2023. Happy reading and happy Poetry Month. One last thing before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to Mrs. Fjord Helms, sixth graders in Durant, Oklahoma. Thanks so much for being here for this First Chapter Friday video. Hi, my name is Amanda Zeba. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. This week, I'm going to be reading to you from Lifeboat 12 by Susan Hood. Let me tell you a couple things about this book. Number one, it is based on a true story. Number two, it is a novel in verse, meaning that uh, the story is told uh, in poems. So it's a nice quick read. And number three, I know you are going to love it. How do I know this? Because shortly after I purchased this book, my 13 year old son came home from school, all excited about the book that he recently checked out from the library. And when we both pulled our books out, they were the same one. So I know that um, if it was appealing enough to him to bring home that I think it's going to be something you're going to want to read as well. Let me tell you uh, what this story is about. And then we will dive into chapter one. And then even more exciting than chapter one is what's going to happen after, because we're going to talk to the author, Susan Hood. With Nazis bombing London every night, it's time for 13-year-old Ken to escape. He expects his stepmother is glad to see him go, but his dad says he's one of the lucky ones, one of the 90 evacuee boy and girls to ship out aboard the SS City of Benares to safety in Canada. Life aboard the luxury ship is grand, nine course meals, new friends, and a life far from the bombs, rations, and his stepmother's glare. Finally, on the fifth day at sea, the ship's officers announced that they're out of danger. They were wrong. You guys, this book oh, just sucks you in and makes you want to keep reading. Chapter one or section one of this book is called Escape and chapter one is called um, The Envelope. At the top of the page, they'll tell you when it is happening and then the title and then the poem. Um, the poems are very short, chapters are very short, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read it till we get to a good stopping point. I shouldn't do it. I know, I shouldn't. I'll be in trouble if I open the large envelope addressed to my parents. But on it is stamped, his Majesty's service. It's not every day a family like mine gets a letter from the king. The clock tick, tick, ticks. I glance down the hall to make sure I'm alone. I slide my finger under the flap and peer inside. Dear sir or madam, I'm directed by the Children's Overseas Reception Scheme. It's nothing, just a dull letter, but wait, someone has written in my name. Your preliminary application has been considered by the board, and they have decided that Kenneth J. Sparks is suitable for being sent to Canada. What are you doing? cries my stepmom, seizing the letter from my hands. That is not addressed to you. Charles, Charles, that cheeky son of yours wants a good cloud about the ears. This letter is about me, I say. You're sending me away. I glare up at my father, who appears in the doorway. My stepmom got her wish to get rid of me. Ken, let me explain, says my dad. This letter could save your life. The reasons why. They sit me down. I shrug their hands off my shoulders and stare at the floor, heart slamming, heat rising. They talk and talk, voices swirling in the air, rising and falling, overlapping and erupting, weaving a net, a trap. But I am not going to fall for it. I try to block them out. I concentrate on slowing the storm in my head. They're sending me away, but... Hang on, what's that about the Germans? The Germans are coming, says Dad. France surrendered this summer and the Nazis are gunning for England next. Hundreds of thousands of parents applied to have their kids sent out of harm's way. You're lucky to have been selected, says Mom. I have a sister in Edmonton, Canada. You can live with her. With your father out of work, money is tight. We can rent out your room to help pay for rations. Just think. Sailing on a ship, says Dad. It will be an adventure. You'll make your own way in the world. Get your head out of those books. My books? It's my stories of buccaneers and buried gold, cowboys, braves, and days of old. I snort. Most parents would be chuffed to have a kid who loves to read. I read them because they take me away, far from the way I'm living. My three-year-old sister toddles over and rests her head on my knees. I run my hand over her curls. What about Margaret? Shouldn't she go too? 
She's too young, says Mum. Only ages 5 through 15 are allowed. At 13, I'll be one of the oldest. No adults, I ask. Parents can't go, says my dad, but you'll have escorts. A whole staff of doctors, nurses, teachers, priests who are volunteering. Yes, son. You're one of the lucky ones. You leave in September. You mustn't tell your friends, though, says Dad. Loose lips sink ships, you know. And there will be a new overcoat for you, says Mom, as if that clinches the deal. I squint up at her and think I'm as good as gone. I tear out of the house. Escape. I dash down the streets, down the railway line, across the tracks, over a fence. There in the wall, behind the loose brick, I snatch my stash of penny cannon fireworks. I stick some in a tree, strike a match to the fuse, and back away as I watch the wick. It sputters, smokes, sparks, blam. It makes quite a hole. The charcoal-scented smoke wafts away in my fury with it. The smoke distracts me as it does angry bees. Let's face it, my stepmom has never liked me. She calls me a terror, a little so-and-so. I wish my own mom were alive. The doctors told her she wasn't supposed to have children, but she didn't listen. She died soon after I was born. It's all my fault. But why did my dad have to marry my nanny? Well, I wouldn't have Margaret otherwise. Sure, she's a bother sometimes, but she makes me laugh. I think about my stepmom, the ship, and this evacuation plan. I feel like a hand-me-down my stepmom doesn't want, so she'll donate me to a good cause. Forget it. I'm not going. She won't get rid of me that easily. I climb over another fence, hoist myself up a tree, and grab an apple to eat. She thinks I'm a terror? Just because I like to scrump a few apples? My dad just says I'm full of beans. I can't get away with much or I'd get a clout round the ear hole or the cane at school. And now they want to send me away across the ocean. Well, I am not going. The New World. That's what they call it. Wonder what it's like. Everything I own is old, tired, secondhand. Well, I got a new mom, but I'm her secondhand kid. She makes me feel worn, torn, worthless. A new world sounds wide open. A chance to start my miserable life over again. A black ant makes his way along the gnarled branch high off the ground. He's brave, that one. I chew on my apple. How can it taste sour and sweet at the same time? Maybe Dad's right. It will be an adventure. Far from the rations, far from my stepmom's scowl, far from the teacher's cane, far from the war. It would be folly to miss this chance. They say I'm one of the lucky ones. Maybe I am. A sea change. A dog starts barking. A man yells, hey, you again? Get down out of that tree. Clear off or I'll have your hide. I pluck another apple, jump down and run for the fence. The dog at my heels. And over, I make my getaway. All the way home, I think of narrow escapes and high adventure. Okay, I'll show them. I'll go and grow up like the chaps in my books, like Wart and Robin Hood. I'll go to sea like Jim Hawkins or Robinson Crusoe. How long will I be gone? Months? Years? Will I ever come back? Liver again. Oh, you're home now, are you? Says my stepmom as I walk in the door. You get a little hungry and all is forgiven? Leave him be, Nora, says my dad. He had a lot to think about. Come on, son, let's down and eat. Mum places a plate of roly-poly on the table. I watched her make it before, a bit of chopped liver rolled up in a pastry of flour, oatmeal, and suet. Disgusting. I grab a potato and say, I'm not hungry. So you will be if this rationing gets any worse, says Mum. Those Huns keep sinking our food supply ships, and you'll be lucky for any scrap you get. That's almost the last meat for the week, so eat up. Any sweets, Mummy? asks Margaret. Yes, dear, says Mum. A nice baked milk pudding for dessert. Now eat your roly-poly. Oof, I'm ready to get out of here. Something new. I haven't had store-bought clothes in months. Maybe years. Make do and mend, everyone says. Part of the war effort. I wear hand-me-downs from cousins and neighbors, patched, faded, worn, torn with stains that won't come out, with arms too long and legs too short. But it's cold in Canada, says my stepmom. With no overcoats to be found from friends, I find myself fussed over in a shop of second-hand clothes. Here's just the ticket, young man, says the storekeeper, who seems beside himself to have a customer. Try it on. I look in the mirror and run my hands down the good English wool. Dark gray, double-breasted, with wide lapels, pockets that are deep, and a belt. I don't recognize the person smiling back at me in the mirror. He almost looks like a man. 
a man with money. Is it warm? asks my stepmom. That's the important thing. Oh, yes, I say. Fifteen shillings, ma'am. Fifteen? Fifteen shillings out of our hard-earned money? I knew it. Nearly a pound of sterling on me? That'll never happen. I start to untie the belt. Oh, very well, she says. There's no getting around it. I hope you appreciate all we're doing for you, Ken. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I follow her out with a grin on my face. This coat is probably the nicest thing I have ever owned. Saturday, September 7th. It begins. September sneaks up on me. I'll be leaving soon. Mom is making me clean out my room to ready it for a border. I'll admit it's a bloomin' mess, but I like it that way. I stack my comics and shove them under the bed. Oof, it's hot, even though the sun is starting to go down. I sweep some trash into the dustbin when... What's that? Sirens. We've heard them before. It's probably just another drill. Then come the explosions. Boom! 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 Dad, I call. Mom! The bombs are not far off. Blasts shatter the air. The earth shudders. Margaret wails. I hear Mom's footsteps rushing to her side. Dad, I yell. Dad! You hold your noise, you, says Mom. You're frightening Margaret. No more forny war, says my dad. We're in the thick of it now. What should we do? Should we get to the shelter? No, come on, Dad says. Get under the table. If it's going to hit us, it's going to hit us. The four of us spend the night huddled under the table. Blasts flash in the dark, momentarily exposing the fear on our faces as the table jumps and the cutlery rattles. Teacups clatter off the shelves and crash to the floor. Mo Margaret fusses and cries, but finally falls off to sleep, overcome and wrung out. I hunker down and stare at the floor, sleepless in shock. This is it. Hitler has taken over Europe, and now he's coming for England. He's coming for us. If you want to find out what happens to Ken uh, and his journey on the boat and um, all of the adventure and the history that comes after it, definitely pick up a copy of Lifeboat. But now let's go chat with the author, Susan Hood. All right, readers, here we are with author Susan Hood. Susan, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. Well, we're going to just jump right into these five questions that I have for you. And the first one is, I learned from doing a little research on your website that this story was born from a relative's letters. Uh, can you tell us about those letters and how they led you to Ken's story? Oh, sure. Um, so this, I got out a picture. This is my mother-in-law, my husband's mom. And she was British. Um, she was a sea evacuee, just like Ken Sparks. Um, she went over to Canada a little earlier than Ken did. And so thankfully for me and my whole family, she mm -hmm. made it safely to Canada. And she started writing letters from to her parents. So when she died, we inherited all these letters. Um, this is an interesting one because it says opened. So the war authorities were opening all the letters going back and forth to make sure that Nobody was spilling war secrets. And I'll give you a little peek at, whoa, hold on. This is a little peek at just one of the suitcases. Wow. You could say. So three suitcases filled with letters. Wow. Um, so that was fascinating. And you can tell so much from just looking at this letter. Like you can tell where she mailed it from. This was actually a little later. It was in 1943, but... This is where her parents were living. This is what stamps looked like. You know, the fact that the authorities opened it. So these primary sources are really incredible. Awesome. And so how did you come upon Ken's story? Okay, so in these letters, Nancy is writing home to her parents about a different ship, the SS Volendam that was torpedoed by the Nazis. And luckily one of the torpedoes was a dud, so the boat did not sink. And oh. the Royal Navy was right out and rescued everybody. And so she's talking about that. And she's saying, isn't it marvelous the Royal Navy saved 300 children? And I went, what? You know, I'm reading this letter saying, what? I, what's happened? So I decided to investigate a little more and that's what led me to the city of Benares and that's what led me to Ken and on. Very cool. Um, dangerous, scary, but um, interesting, definitely. Um, so you mentioned uh, the word primary document. So um, 
I know that for the research, you used the letters. You also conducted interviews. Can you talk about the importance of, of using primary documents and why they're so valuable? Sure. Um, it's a lot easier to find facts if you go to primary sources. So if you go to letters and telegrams, and um, I went to the National Archives in Britain, and they had copies of the newspaper. So you could see the headlines. Um, yes. And so you could see they thought 83 children had died because Lifeboat 12 was still missing. Um, yes. So it really helps you get to the nitty gritty facts. Like I found telegrams that said exactly what um, the parents heard when they found Lifeboat 12. So it said something like rejoice at the survival of your gallant son. Just, I think that's like amazing. And so you can put those quotes in your book. Um, so it really helps. Um, I do look at secondary sources too. So there are other books that have been written about this subject. Um, and I tend to take them all with a grain of salt because um, a lot of them are great books, but um, they reflect the author's maybe interests or biases. Um, and, you know, it's their interpretation of what happened. So that might be a little different from the exact facts. Um, but I think it's important to look at both so you get a well-rounded picture of everything. You know, if you read a lot of different books about it, you get a lot of different opinions about it. So you take that all in. And then I think you have a much better picture of the big event. Yeah, that is such great advice, especially in this day and age when we're living uh, with so much misinformation surrounding us. Um, students, if you're having to do a research project, think about the validity of your sources. Um, and I think, Susan, that's great advice. Like, look at a, a wide variety of sources and let them, yeah. you know, give you a, a big picture um, rather than letting one person's bias or, or ideas influence right. it. So, because, great like, I'm writing a book about spiders now. And... I kind of find spiders pretty fascinating, but if I was a person who was scared of spiders or hated spiders, that would be a very different book. So I'd be bringing my own biases to that book. So you just Absolutely. sort of have to take into effect or into consideration who the author is and what they might think about this subject. Yes, great advice. Um, my next question to you is about the format of this book. So this is a novel in verse, a story told in poems. Um, I'm curious how and why you chose that. Did it always, was it always going to be a novel in verse in your head? Or tell us a little bit about um, how you chose that format. Yeah, well, I, you know, this was my first middle grade novel. And I didn't really know how to write a middle grade novel. But I did know how to write poetry because I've used a lot of poetry in my picture books. So that was sort of in my toolbox. So when I was taking courses and things and learning how to write a middle grade novel, at least I had that in my back pocket. And I also love poetry. I love wordplay. I love, you know, fooling around with words. I love in novels and verse, you know, if a road goes like this, you could make the text go like this. You could just fool around with it. So it's really fun. Um, I also thought... Um, Free verse allows you to put a lot of emotion into very few words, so you can get to the heart of the emotion really fast. And all that white space, I think, is also good insulation when you're talking about really scary things. You know, you have white space all around it, so it's not quite as daunting. It's a little breathing room, I think. So I kind of think um, verse is a very good way to talk about scary things. Yeah, definitely. Well, it worked. You did a great job. Thank you. Um, in your bio, I read that you are a sailor, that you enjoy spending time on boats, and that you use some of your own personal experiences, even a personal experience of being somewhat lost, um, to inform yeah. this story. And so can you talk to us a little bit about using a personal hobby um, to inform or to influence a story? Sure. Um, yeah, I've been a sailor all my life. I am no stranger to trouble at sea. I actually sailed on a 38 foot sailboat from Tortola to Bermuda and back to Connecticut with wow. five other people. And three days out, we lost lights, navigation and the engine. So we had to steer by the stars. We didn't know if we were going to find Bermuda. So I, I know personally what that fear is like. And so I was able to kind of remember that and use it in telling Lifeboat 12. 
um, you know, I think your own personal experiences will inject maybe your own enthusiasm or your own emotions or your own knowledge into the book. Yeah. Uh, coincidentally, I've been to Bermuda and it's like an island the size of my city. And so right. thinking of <laughs> how how small that is and how big the ocean is and like, yeah. uh, and I'm sure you knew that that's what you, that you were looking for this itty bitty piece and how, oh, how nervous. Yeah, I thought we were going to Spain. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad that you made it uh, safe and sound. Thanks. Me too. Um, my final question for you, this is a historical fiction novel. Um, I was a social studies minor once upon a time. And so I've often thought about like, it would be really cool to live in certain periods of time in history. Like I was obsessed with castles in the medieval ages, like never mind that it was cold and there's lots of diseases. But for me, I was like, right. that's, you know, <laughs> so if you had to pick a time period in history to live in, um, what would you choose? Yeah, I tend to like to look forward rather than back. So what I would like to do is sort of jump ahead maybe 20, 30 years and see what this generation of kids are going to accomplish because I'm constantly flabbergasted at what kids are doing and how they care about the planet. You know, that's why I wrote um, this book, The Last Straw, Kids Versus Plastics, because I found all these incredible stories of what eight, nine, 10 year olds are doing to, you know, get rid of plastic pollution. Um, I also think they're really tuned into social justice and human rights. And I just think they're going to do amazing things. So I, I really would like to jump forward and see that, you know, see the day that maybe we have a woman president and maybe, I don't know what else, but, you know, everyone has equal rights. That would be incredible. So that's yeah, sort well of my fondest hope. Yes, fingers crossed for that vision. Absolutely. Um, before we go, can you tell us uh, if you're working on anything new now and where if readers have more questions, they might be able to connect with you? Oh, sure. Um, yes, I had a book that came out. Where did it go? Um, hold on a second. Sorry. This came out like two days ago. It's called Harboring oh, Hope, Another Boat Story. Um, this is a nonfiction book in verse about Denmark during World War II. And it's incredible. It's about this young woman who saved, helped save or helped evacuate 300 Jewish people from Denmark to Sweden. Um, so it's kind of the true story behind one of my favorite books, Number of the Stars. Because mm -hmm. um, Sweden was a free country, Denmark was occupied by the Nazis, and after three years of occupation, the Nazis said, let's round up all the Jewish people and send them to concentration camps. And the Danish people said, oh, no, 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 you will not. And so they mm -hmm. hid them, they put them in little boats, sailed them across to Sweden, and saved something like 95% of the population. Amazing. So it's this phenomenal story. Um, so that just came out, and then... This came out uh, last March, um, Alice Anna, and it's about two uh, sisters who are piano prodigies who live in Ukraine, of all things. No idea we were going to be where we are with Ukraine when I started that book. Um, but that just got a lovely award um, yesterday. It won the Christopher Award. So that was super exciting. Thank you. I picked a good week to talk to. You have lots of great yes, things. Yes, exactly. Um, and if people want to find out more, you can go to my website, which is susanhoodbooks.com. And I'm happy to answer reader letters and things like that. So amazing. Well, I will make sure to put links to all of your books and your websites uh, down in the video description box. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for telling mm -hmm. amazing stories. Um, we love them. Thank you so much. Love talking to Bye. you. Bye. To continue reading Lifeboat 12, pick up a copy from your school library, purchase one from your favorite local indie bookstore, or grab it via the link in the description box. Then be sure to check out the rest of the full First Chapter Friday playlist, including all of the novels and verse I have there for you. This week's mystery quote says, Arm in arm, leaning on each other, we make our way home. Together. Thanks so much for stopping by my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd. I hope I'll see you again for another First Chapter Friday video. Be sure to check out these other places online for more great content. See you again next time, and happy reading.